Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're going to discuss the economic stimulus that the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister have talked about. We have with us Professor Prabhat Patnaik and he will give us, uh, I hope, an uh, overview of what is happening. Prabhat, we have been talking about the stimulus and this is a series of so-called stimuli that has been uh, offered to the Indian economy. Do you see this stimulus, the 20 lakh crore package, which is being talked of as an economic stimulus, which will set production as well as money in the hands of the people? No, in fact, this is not a stimulus at all. Uh, the word stimulus used for this package is a complete misnomer because at the moment, the Indian economy is essentially constrained severely by a shortage of demand. This was the case even before the pandemic began. And this has now become even more serious because there are lots of people with no incomes whatsoever. And therefore, there is a shortage of demand. The whole idea was really to stimulate demand by putting purchasing power in the hands of the people. And for this, the government had to play a proactive role in ensuring income transfers to the people and in ensuring other kinds of welfare expenditures. This is not what the government has done. If you look at the total fiscal effort of the government, the total expenditure that is involved in the stimulus that actually, or in the so-called stimulus, that actually comes to less than two lakh crores, which is really just about a bit less perhaps than 1% of the GDP. Now, this is not only trivial compared to the kind of uh, percentages which other countries are giving in the form of fiscal stimuli for their economies, but this is also trivial compared to the requirements of the economy faced with this extremely serious humanitarian crisis. Basically, the package consists of a whole lot of changes in policy in favor of private capital and multinationals and a lot of offer of bank credit to the to business which in itself doesn't help in stimulating activity so bank credit hmm, sorry please the go ahead. question that we have here is that in instead of transferring purchasing power to the people therefore providing a push to the real economy which is production and consumption what we have here is essentially expansion of credit for the capitalist class big business or now medium and small scale as well though that has been redefined but we really are not going to see production pick up unless there is ability to purchase Yes, exactly. And, and, and because of that, even the credit offers are unlikely to be taken up because after all, business requires credit in order to expand production. Credit is required for working capital and so on. When demand picks up, then there is the possibility of the business expanding output. That's when it requires credit. Credit is a lubricant in actually the production process. So simply offering credit does not make people produce more. As a result, even these offers of credit are unlikely to be actually picked up by the producers unless there is a stimulation of demand. So effectively what we have done, apart from what has been offered to the medium small scale industries who at the moment cannot even pay their wage bill or cannot buy raw materials. There is, I think, about a three and a half lakh crore being offered to the MSMEs. That might see some offtake, but otherwise there is really no incentive for anybody else, as you say, to even avail of the credit. Yes, exactly. You know, even the offtake of credit that may be required because, let's say, wages have to be paid and so on, is something which would really kick in only when people get employed and, and once employment increases that's really with a view to producing more. Now when that begins to happen then of course credit becomes relevant. That will begin to happen only when there is the promise of being able to sell it on the market which means an expansion of demand. Order books start increasing, lengthening. So the second part of the issue of course is that the centralization we have seen of the government has meant 
the transfers to the state governments are also not taking place, even the ones which are supposed to take place in any case, like the GST uh, devolution, for example, that the GST funds have to go to the states in the proportion they were promised. So that has stopped and the states out of the so-called stimulus and so-called expansion that the government claims to be making, nothing has been really left really in the state's kitty. Yes, that's absolutely true, because the states are now, let's look at the condition of the states. Not only is it the case that they haven't got the GST compensation, which was actually legally their due, which was, which was solemnly promised to them when they signed on to the GST. Not only has that not been given, but what is more, their revenues have really drastically fallen in this period of close down and so on. While on the other hand, they are having to make very substantial amounts of additional expenditure, both for, for, for healthcare, for hospitals, and also for even for the for, for, for transporting migrant workers and all kinds of purposes of that kind. They are being made to bear the brunt of this pandemic in fiscal terms. As a result, the states are in a desperate financial situation. They cannot print notes. And as a result, it was essential for the government, for the central government, to hand over larger amounts to the states and to finance it immediately by printing notes. So it's a key issue really is that while the central government can print notes, increase, increase, increase its fiscal deficit, and thereby create liquidity, the state governments don't have that power. They can't print notes, they cannot increase their deficit in, 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 in infinitely in the sense. No, in fact, they actually cannot increase their deficits without the center's permission. In other words, no state government can simply, on its own, enlarge its fiscal deficit. It, they would require permission from the center to borrow in the market. And of course, mind you, this is a situation where borrowing in the market, even if their fiscal deficit is enlarged, borrowing in the market is not the best of options because you borrow in the market at a certain interest rate. Now, that interest rate must exceed the rate of growth of the net state domestic product for the states not to fall into a debt trap. Now, at this moment, everybody knows, we know that actually uh, the rate of growth of state domestic products is not going to be very much, probably close to zero, if not negative. And in this kind of a situation, to borrow in the market is really out. The Reserve Bank should actually give them concessional finance, even for the fiscal deficit part of it, that, but in addition, the center has to make resources available to them based on its own borrowings from the, fiscal, from the Reserve Bank of India. That would be uh, an immediate help to them. So these are the two aspects of the larger financial and economic question facing the country. And from what we see, the government seems to have a very accounting uh, understanding of the economy, which you saw also in the monetization, demonetization part that they seem to think accounts is finance, accounts is economy, and which it is not. And this is essentially what underlines the understanding of the stimulus as well as what is being called the credit being painted as stimulus. Would you agree that this is really but, the problem yeah, that is there? Absolutely. But, but there is one difference between the demonetization situation and now. Both are examples of the mindlessness on the part of the central government. But demonetization was, as it were, its own, its own original mindlessness. Well, now there is a fear of the credit rating agencies, which is involved. In other words, they are terrified. And this is amazing because this entire package has been presented as a kind of means towards self-reliance. As a matter of fact, the package is what it is. The total inability of the government to provide larger expenditure, but to rely on borrowings, is because they do not want the credit rating of the country to go down, because they do not want to offend globalized finance. And therefore, they want to link the fates of billions of people 
to the whims of credit rating agencies and to globalized finance. They are worried that if they enlarge expenditures, the fiscal deficit goes up, in which case finance would leave the country. Now, finance is already leaving the country. Very important at this stage is to actually think in terms of putting controls on financial outflows, but that the Modi government doesn't have the gumption to do, which is why they are actually doing this kind of miserliness. The other part of it is, of course, this they have used to do exactly what they wanted, changing labor laws, holding essentially labor hostage to capital. It's not no longer wage slavery. They want to really impose slavery, hire and fire at will, 12-hour and sometimes 14-hour week. And it's also being supported by people like Narayan Murthy, who said, Labor should I agree to 60 hour a week? Of course, Azim Premji has said something different. So at least one capitalist has spoken out that this is not in the interest of capital to hold labor hostage in this particular way and also at this particular time. But you know, this, this mindset we also see in privatization of the public sector. You are talking of self reliance, you are asking in international capital to come up to 74% in defense and space. The two areas which were essentially government preserved till now. And this is an amazing example to talk and call it self reliance, Atma Nirbhar Bharat. Particularly, all that you were getting is offshoring some assembly in the last, shall we say, the last mile into India and calling this self reliance. Yes, I, I, I completely agree that, you know, the mendacity underlying this entire package and its, 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 its publicity is just quite amazing because you claim for it something which is just the opposite of what it is meant to do. And what is more, what it is, you know, it would not even succeed in attracting substantial amounts of investment into India because in the international economy itself now, the, the, the investment levels are down. The world economy is moving into a very serious recession. Now, in this kind of a situation, in any case, there is very little chance for investment, productive investment to come into a country. So no matter how much you open up, you're not even going to get that. But in the process, you would have smashed your labor and you have uh, you would have withdrawn your labor laws and so on. You would have actually introduced a repressive labor regime for a gain that would not even arise. I mean, first of all, it's doubtful if, 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 if you can call it a gain of any kind, but, but, but secondly, it would, would not even come in. But the point I want to make is that, you know, this suppression of labor rights is really part of a whole range of other suppressions. Suppression of democratic rights, arrests of anti-CAA activists, the spread of the communal virus in the midst of this pandemic itself is part of the same mindset. And that mindset is not just a mindset. Of course, it's a mindset, but additionally, I believe it's going to grow because of the objective basis for it is being prepared by the government. You see, look at other countries. In this period, when people are in distress, they're all coming with all kinds of relief packages. Here, what happens is when people are in distress, there, there's no relief package. Now, if there's no relief package, the legitimacy of the government is really under question. When it is questioned, you therefore require other kinds of props for your legitimacy. And one obvious prop is that the Muslims are behind this, and we are anti-Muslim, therefore you trust us, and so on. So it will try and seek public support on all kinds of grounds other than its ability to provide relief. Therefore, I, I, I see this as a movement towards greater and greater authoritarianism and this, the, 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 the smashing of the, I mean, the withdrawing, the abrogation of labor laws, is really part of this whole scenario. It's also interesting because what it will do is, of course, reduce employment. If you have 12-hour day, then, of course, you need less labor. And if you have less labor, you have less employment. And then we come back to the issue, where is the demand? Where is the buying purchasing power of the people if they don't have jobs? So it's really that vicious circle again. Yes. 
it, 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 in fact, it would actually reduce employment in the economy as a whole, because any reduction in wages, you see, after all, the whole purpose of all this ultimately is to shift income distribution away from the workers towards the capitalists. I mean, that's the, as it were, in a nutshell, what, what, what all this is supposed to achieve. Every such shift in income distribution reduces demand because the rupee shifted from the workers to the capitalists is ipso facto demand reducing. And of course, there is one, one further point here, namely that it would not necessarily reduce the demand only for the corporate segment or only for the monopoly segment. They may bear a bit of the brunt for the reduction in demand, but they would make up for it through the increase in profit margins. Think of the non-corporate capital. They would face the brunt of the reduction in demand, but at the same time, their profit margins are not going up in any way. As the petty producers, the small capitalists, and so on, and there also entails a shift in income distribution from the smaller capitalists and petty capitalists to the monopolists and the corporate sector. And that is has been the political base of this political party, the BJP, for a long time. Is the petty yes. trader, petty commodity exactly. producer based yes. or small capital, but that's also being squeezed as also is the middle class, though it is also another vociferous supporter of the communalization and authority, authoritarian trend that we see, which is going to be hit. But as long others, I guess, are hit harder, they may not therefore feel the pain so much. So thank you, Prabhat, for being with us. And sharing your thoughts with us. Any last thoughts on which way India is now going to go? Well, you know, you can see that the traders have not welcomed this package. So, so the traditional base of the BJP is not welcoming this package. On the other hand, of course, the corporates are welcoming it and the corporate donations in the BJP gets are really very, very substantial. So, so, so they hope to make use of that. So let's hope that the larger population in the country is slowly going to understand this package is not helping and we need something else as policies in order to fight the larger question arising out of the pandemic. Pandemic has triggered a larger set of questions and how we face it as people and nation is going to be the question. Thank you, Prabhat, for being with us. Hope to see you again soon. On New Thank you. This is the time we have today. Do keep watching News Click and do visit our website.